I'm Jeremy Schwartz. I'm an associate professor in general internal medicine at the medical school and chronic disease epidemiology here at YSPH. And I'm here today um, as the director of the YGH faculty network program. And this is a fireside chat. So I just want you to imagine we're gathered around a fire. It's cozy. It's warm. <laughs> I thought about bringing an electric fireplace that we have at home, but that's probably a fire hazard, so we didn't do that. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about the Faculty Network program, but first, um, again, I'm joined by five dear colleagues, each of whom leads one, or in some cases, more than one, uh, of the YIGH faculty networks. So I just want to start before I introduce the program uh, just by asking each of you to introduce yourself, name, title at Yale, uh, which faculty network you lead, and any, or, or which faculty network or networks you lead, and any other networks with which you affiliate, just to sort of get the ball rolling. So Mark, do you want to start? Good morning. Uh, my name is Marek Czaworski. I'm a professor at the Department of Psychiatry and Emergency Medicine, and I am representing uh, uh, Global Addiction uh, Global Addictions Network. Great, thanks. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kieran O'Donnell, and I'm an assistant professor jointly appointed in the Child Study Center in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences. I co-lead the Biological Embedding Global Research and Intervention Network with my dear colleague, Susie Rule. If you could put up your hand and wave, Susie, to everyone can see you. Um, and uh, yeah, I would love to tell you a little bit more about our network through this discussion. Thank you. I'm Evelyn Shea. I'm a faculty member at the School of Medicine and also secondarily appointed here at the School of Public Health in Chronic Disease Epidemiology. I'm currently the lead of the Yale Network for Global NCDs, which was co-founded by Jeremy Tracy, Nikki Hawley, and Christine Gurria, um, and others. Um, and uh, I have a affiliation also with the HIV, Global HIV Network. And if I'm leaving others out, sorry. <laughs> Oh, you have uh, hi, I'm Sunil Parikh. I'm associate professor in uh, EMD, also in the section of infectious diseases. Uh, I lead the uh, malaria, Yale, malaria Yale. I said the name in a incorrectly already. <laughs> it's um, malaria Yale. It's supposed to be. You came up with it yourself. It was supposed to be catchy, and I ruined it. So, uh, malaria Yale. So you get it? Well, yeah. Um, Amy is a part of it. Uh, I, I don't feel like I deserve credit for being the lead. It's really a group of uh, folks from the infectious disease section across the university, and it's it's been a great experience, which I'll tell you more about. Thanks. Um, so my name is Tracy Rabin, and I'm an associate professor of uh, general medicine at the School of Medicine, as well as a clinical professor of nursing at the School of Nursing. Um, and I, in addition to be part, being part of Engine. Um, I am the co-director of the Yale Global Health Ethics Faculty Network, together with my colleague Kaveh Koshnud at the School of Public Health. Uh, and I also co-direct the Yale Uganda Network uh, with my colleague Eleanor Reed from the Department of Emergency Medicine. All right. Great. I yes. was just going to say something. Sunil, it was not just you. I forgot to highlight the most fun part about Engine, which is the name Engine. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, back to you, Gary. <laughs> Thank you, Evelyn. Um, okay, so so for just briefly about the faculty network program for for those of you who are, are not aware. So uh, we currently include fourteen networks in the in the portfolio. Though hopefully that will continue to grow. And these networks, as I think you're getting a, a glimpse of now, really span globally important thematic areas. Um, I don't want to leave any out, so I'm just going to read through the list just so you have a sense of what all the, the current networks are. So and you've already heard some of them. So Yale Antimicrobial Resistance Network. The Yale Biological Embedding Global Research and Intervention Network, or BEGIN. You can see some of them have really great acronyms. <laughs> the Yale Emergency Critical Care and Disaster Medicine Network, or ECTM. The Yale Global Addictions Network. The Yale Global HIV AIDS Research Network, or GARNER. The Yale Global Health Ethics Network. Yale Network for Global NCDs, or ENGINE. The Yale Global Surgery Network. The Yale Global Women's Health Network. Malaria Yale, which is the only one that doesn't start with Yale, but we just, we, we couldn't do Yale Malaria Yale. Right? Um, Yale Planetary Health Interdisciplinary Network Exchange, or FINEX, uh, with which uh, Jeanette, so that was an example, the, Jeanette's presentation of the HECT Award sort of went through the, the Planetary Health Network. 
uh, Yale Uganda, which is the only geographically and not thematically aligned network, the Yale Network for Vaccine Initiatives, and finally the Yale, uh, the Yale Vector-Borne and Zoonotic Diseases Network. So it really covers a, a, a really impressive breadth. So just briefly, the faculty network program grew out of the efforts of ENGINE, which formed about, I think, eight, 2015. nine years ago. <laughs> We were, at the time, we were a group of junior faculty, each developing our own body of work in global NCD space, but committed to harnessing the power of collaboration, knowing that we could have greater impact working together through collaboration than remaining in our own uh, little silos. And so Engine was followed soon thereafter by Malaria Yale and Yale Uganda, and really over the last four years or so has grown to now encompass these 14 networks that I, that I mentioned. So we define a faculty network within YGH as a group of Yale faculty members who coalesce to form a long-term collaborative academic or research partnership and or research partnership centered on a thematic or in some cases geographic area and whose members forge an identity as members of the network and come to share a collective set of goals regarding the network. And importantly, um, faculty networks really should be filling a gap, on, a, a gap that's present on campus, so adding value to the broader institution through collaboration. And as YGH centrally, we work with the faculty network leads, some of whom are on stage with me, to support and nurture these networks, and then with other faculty who, have, who come to us with networks that, with ideas about developing uh, new networks. And finally, as I think you'll get a sense of as we start our discussion, while we at YGH help to support and nurture and guide, we really don't have a strict blueprint which the networks must follow. Um, so I think you'll get a sense of this. Uh, all of the, each of those 14 networks are in different developmental stages. Each have sort of different models. Um, and we think that that's a strength. Um, and finally, if there are any students in the audience who have any interest in playing a role in supporting any of the networks or the network program, please don't hesitate to come up to me or Mike or, or other folks at YGH throughout the day. So with that as a background, um, I just wanted to start out by you know, starting this cozy fireside chat um, by asking you to tell us a little bit more about your network. Why is your network's theme important to you and your members in the global context? And how did forming your network address a gap that might have been present on campus? So what's your network? What is, what is it about? How is it globally important? And how does it fit in or fill a gap here at Yale? And in no specific order. So whoever wants to, to start. Sure. Okay. It was bound to happen. <laughs> um, so, um, so the Yale Ethics Network. Uh, so my co my colleague uh, Kave and I uh, were um, sort of had been engaging in different um, different programs focused on educating students, students are, who are doing research, students who are doing clinical programs in global health. Um, but really thinking about how are they learning about the ethical challenges involved in, in each of those areas. And we had been independently doing this work for a number of years with groups of students um, as well. Uh, I would say myself, I started in 2010 um, engaging in doing sort of pre-departure training, talking with students who were about to engage on uh, in um, sort of clinical global health uh, uh, um, trips, uh, rotations, uh, talking to them before they would go and then when they would come back. So we had been doing this for a number of years. The idea for the um, Institute for Global Health was um, in the works. And we thought to ourselves, you know, we are sort of doing this independently. Wouldn't it be wonderful if YIGH were the place to really galvanize these efforts and think about how trainees, not just in the health profession schools, but really across the university, we're being prepared to engage with partners around the world and, and really around the country as well because we believe uh, in a definition of global health that includes the fact that the United States is on the globe. Um, so, so anyway, so we had formed uh, the Global Health Ethics Program uh, when YIGH was formed and started to realize how many other faculty and staff around the university were also touching learners before they were engaging in different global health initiatives. Um, and I would say um, this sort of sparked the idea for the network. Um, and we, we may be one of the only networks that is, is really focused internally. So while our faculty are part of other initiatives around the university that are focused on ethics work that has sort of external reach, 
our purview has really grown to be around, um, you know, how are we preparing the learners at this institution? What are the role, how are we serving as role models? What are the examples that we're setting for students who want to engage with partners in other places? And so um, our network really came to be um, around the time that a group that I'm part of an international interprofessional and multi-sectoral group called Advocacy for Global Health Partnerships was um, developing the Brochet Declaration, which is, um, this international declaration that's focused on criteria that one should be thinking about when engaging in global health partnerships. So thinking about bi-directionality, thinking about sustainability, thinking about who is driving the agenda, six key principles. Um, and so one of the first things that we did as a network was to talk with the leadership of YIGH and encourage them to actually sign on to this declaration. And then part of the task of our network has been thinking about, well, how are we gonna actually implement this as a university? It's one thing to put our name on the website, but it's another thing to think about, well, what does it mean for Yale College when they're giving summer travel grants to students to go anywhere in the world? What does it mean to talk with those students about the challenges they may face, but even before that, to think about how do they construct a project where they're making use of mentors who are appropriately um, compensated for their time, appropriately um, prepared to host uh, students. I would say that we've had um, just phenomenal participation, not just from faculty, but also staff. Um, I especially want to shout out my colleague, Kate Nyhan, who is a phenomenal librarian at the medical school who just is full of resources and is just so excited. Open access publishing is one issue that we've started to take on and thinking about, you know, how, you know, what do our faculty know about open access publishing and, and how, um, you know, how is our work um, being made accessible to partners around the globe? Um, so that is one issue that we've been focused on. Um, again, working with Yale College, I think one highlight um, of our network is that um, when our colleagues in the college were starting to revamp their pre-departure um, requirements for students, they reached out and we convened a group and said, well, we'll just provide some expertise from you know all around this, the, the university, uh, thinking about how we each prepare our learners and how can we use um, those best practices to uh, augment efforts that the college is putting into place. So I will stop there. Great. Thanks, Tracy. All right. Sunil? Thanks, Tracy. Uh, and I just want to highlight the pre-departure training that Tracy and others have been leading. Um, we've benefited with the Downs Fellowship, which some of you know about from that pre-departure training. and It's been really a fantastic uh, part of the global health process here. So I, um, again, uh, am part of the Malaria Yale Network. Amy is part of it. Um, when I, I came here in 2012, and there were a handful of people working in malaria, just actually really one person working solely on malaria, but others that were working on malaria as part of what they were doing. Uh, and when YIGH was formed, talking to Saad and Mike Skenechny, um, and with the influx of additional people working in malaria, uh, it really became necessary or, uh, you know, the opportunity, a critical mass was forming where we could really start to think about how we can be greater than the individual, you know, the sum could be greater than our individual parts. Um, I've had the you know fortune of being at some really great malaria uh, research institutions uh, throughout my training. Um, but one of the things that was unique coming here is the ability to really think about malaria in a context where we can think about every aspect of the disease, or at least as much <laughs> as many as we could uh, possibly fit in. So. You know, traditionally where I had been, it had been really focused on the human host, and we're, I'm a clinician, clinician scientist, but coming here, there, were, there was amazing work going on on the vector side of things. We had insectaries available. We had people working with uh, a non Anopheles mosquitoes, so Aedes and Culex and other um, vectors, uh, tsetse flies. Um, we also had people uh, at the... Uh, other parts of the campus, even in archaeology, starting to think about malaria. And uh, so this opportunity for the network really uh, was, was game-changing, I think, for us. Uh, so we started this network and really brought together folks from uh, ecology, evolutionary biology, the School of Medicine, basic drug discovery, uh, genetics of the vector, um, and uh, we've been meeting now, I think, you know, anywhere from quarterly to monthly, 
And I think over the, I guess, some more years, five years, six years, six years, um, it's evolved. I think when I started, um, you know, we had lofty goals. Uh, you know, one of the things we wanted to do is let's see if we can come up with a PO1, you know, in a year, which is ridiculous, right? Um, but really something where we could bring in the vector, the parasite, the host into a, a really comprehensive grant. Maybe we could focus efforts on a few of our sites and build up our collaborations at those locations um, even more. Uh, but I think over time, one of the things I've learned at least is to just, and I think this holds true for global health in general, is you know, uh, it's less about leading, it's about listening and trying to understand really what it is that the different people in the network want to get out of it. So I think we've just let it happen organically now where um, we invite students to come and, and uh, present or faculty. And if there is interest in leveraging what was just presented for a common research project, a grant application, that's great. And I think with that organic kind of approach, a lot of collaborations have uh, um, Forms. I'll just highlight one because it's kind of unique. Uh, and I think actually Joe Vanetz was the reason that this uh, individual came to malaria. But uh, Rod McIntosh, who works in archaeology looking for malaria and ancient bone specimens, I would have never met this person had we not had a, uh, a uh, network like this. So um, uh, now we're working on a project, the student together with Amy as well, um, where we're leveraging some of the stuff we're doing uh, to also help uh, them look for malaria and bone specimens around the world. It's pretty crazy. So, okay, thank you, Sunil. Um, no. Thank you so much. So, as Jeremy alluded to, the Yale Network for Global NCDs came together in 2015, and there was a group of us uh, who attended a conference at Emory University that had brought together. Uh, global NCD researchers from across the country who were uh, working on different topics but facing some of the same challenges in terms of one, communicating the urgency of global NCDs to the broader, you know, global landscape, and two, navigating career paths in the field of global NCDs because at that time, there was a lot more, um, I think, institutional knowledge about how to foster someone's career if they were pursuing global health in certain tracks. You know, probably infectious disease was a good example. Um, but in a lot of the uh, conversations around the table for colleagues in the global NCD space, they were maybe the lone uh, global health researcher or faculty person within a larger neurology you know, department, for example, or um, rheumatology, which is my case. Um, so, you know, so I think that in addition to the urgency of global NCDs becoming, you know, the number one drivers of, you know, top several drivers of mortality globally, top several drivers of disability globally. Um, in addition to that urgency, I think there was also a recognition that there is so much complexity to creating health systems and, um, institutes that are equipped to tackle these challenges, and that there were so many gaps along the line in terms of research infrastructure, training, uh, even clinical capacity, um, and, um, and then on the side of investigators from the US just being able to carve out that support and career path to be able to you know, continue doing the work that they felt was so important in their various fields, and our group, um, includes those from the uh, School of Medicine, School of Public Health, and eventually the School of Nursing. We started with seven individuals. We really, um, that was before YIGH, so we had to be pretty scrappy back then. Uh, we were able to secure you know, bits of funding from the Macmillan Center, uh, from the Yale Leadership Global, uh, Yale Global Leadership. Oh, leadership. Yes, right. Um, and also the Yale Networks, um, program from across campus, and we hosted a symposium where we invited, um, I would say, almost 100 uh, individuals from across campus to just uh, come together and start to have a, 
a nucleus of interest in global NCDs on campus and um, had several breakout sessions that followed. And then in the ensuing several years, we kind of struggled as a small group to figure out how to sustain these activities. And we would really partner with other groups that were inviting speakers to campus. And then we would have a special NCD, global NCD related talk. Um, and it was really through some critical funding through the HECT uh, faculty network awards. It wasn't called that in the first iteration, and later it was. And also, um, you know, I think we're very appreciative that we were brought to the table when YIGH itself was forming, because uh, YIGH had a very, you know, th those that were forming YIGH had a very um, strong interest in what the needs were among faculty, uh, early career faculty. And so we, we um, were very grateful to be able to be at that conversation and put forth some of the lessons we had learned along the way. Um, and so I, I think for us in the early phase, it was more about developing this um, peer support network, sort of learning from each other, because maybe in our individual departments, there wasn't a collective knowledge about how to advance careers yet. And um, while still championing the, you know, the importance of global NCDs, and then over time, really working in partnership with YGH and others to sort of figure out what the value of faculty networks are, and then how to grow. And our latest, um, so we had one HECT award, which allowed us as a group to work in Uganda on a project where we were able to co-mentor a Ugandan trainee and a Yale trainee to do work focused on hypertension and diabetes, self-care. And then later on, several years later, we were able to obtain another HECT award to really expand Engine. And so now we have you know, about 30 members, I would say, at the last count from a really broad range of um, you know, departments, uh, schools, and we have you know, regular meetings where we have uh, faculty presenting work or their trainees presenting work. We have upcoming a pitch fest because we also have this sort of dream of the P01 or you know, <laughs> P30, um, which kind of keeps us you know, inspired and moving forward. Um, so, and we, we've engaged trainees in a lot of ways. I don't want to, in, in several different ways, I don't want to give away the punchline because uh, our current engine fellow will be presenting this afternoon, so I hope you can see that. Um, but we've had a few key projects where we've been able to bring in uh, trainees at different stages, whether it's med student, public health student, or um, postdoctoral or doctoral students. Um, and, and get them involved as well. I think I'm going to stop there, but yeah, um, you'll hear perfect. more Thank later. Good morning again, everyone. Such a pleasure to be here today. Um, you know, we've seen each other a lot on Zoom windows, and it's wonderful to actually meet in person. Um, I think, feel like I should start with a definition, though, because when we were having a conversation earlier this morning, I realized that the concept of biological embedding isn't necessarily familiar to everyone. Um, and I think that really speaks to the concept of silos that we've been hearing a lot about today. So my silo is social epigenetics, and we think about biological embedding as how stress, adversity, or also possibly positive experiences, for example, early interventions, might get under the skin. So how can we quantify that biologically and how can we mobilize that information to improve health outcomes across the lifespan? Now, so the Biological Embedding Global Research and Intervention Network is co-led by myself and Susie Rule, who you may know from EHS 544, Climate Equity and Health Policy Methods. Did I get that right? <laughs> Phew. <laughs> um, and so what's, I think, interesting about our network and really drew me to working with Susie on this is that inherent within our the design of our network is an emphasis on health policy. So Susie is an incredible environmental justice lawyer who's um, really um, advanced um, so many pieces of legislation that are critically important from a triple bottom line perspective. And so with regard to our network, really it's trying to fuse basic science, medicine, implementation science, with um, health policy formation. Um, and so we do take a global to local perspective, um, so with work occurring both internationally but also um, locally. And so I used a term there, triple bottom line justice, which again wasn't familiar to me when I first heard it and may not be familiar to many in the audience. Um, and so just in the same way that we think about there being no health without mental health, triple bottom line justice um, principles suggest that climate, our environmental justice, health justice, 
um, and economic justice are inextricably linked. And really, when we're thinking about initiatives, we need to be thinking about the broader perspective, incorporating all of these principles to really advance health and well-being of those that are overburdened and underserved. Um, so really, throughout the work that we do with the Begin Network, it's informed by triple bottom line justice principles. And at the core of triple bottom line justice is deep engagement with those overburdened and underserved individuals. So that's the definition, a very long-winded definition of our network name. Um, but the origin of our network really comes from Upon reflection, quite an audacious idea and initiative really led by my colleague um, Susie. Um, and this idea um, stemmed from us joining Yale in the same day in 2020. It was an election year. And the idea was, could we draft an executive order that we could get to the Biden-Harris campaign that would focus on three-generation health and well-being, three-generation mental health with a tri triple bottom line justice perspective. Um, so we brought together um, a number of colleagues across Medicine, Public Health, School of Nursing, um, outside of Yale to really discuss what this would look like as a draft model exec executive order. And what we quickly realized, and this is a theme that we've heard so much this morning, is that we were each operating in our silos. So I was focused on basic research and public health and thinking, how can we get more funding for this type of research? My colleagues in the Child Study Center are focusing on clinical practice. How can we reach more people? How can we improve the um, health and well-being of our communities? And of course, then policy thinking about how can we really just drive our agenda forward in terms of health policy? And what we really wanted to do was build upon this experience of trying to break down those silos across our respective disciplines and create some form of network that would allow us to come together regularly um, to discuss ideas. And really, that was the origin of um, BEGIN. I will say we are very early in our developmental stage, um, probably still early infancy. Um, I will also say that our table is very large. There is a lot of space at our table. And if there's anyone in the room that finds this network potentially of interest, please come see myself or Susie. We'd be more than happy to um, have you join. Um, we will hear from Jeffrey Botang, who's talking about some of the application of triple bottom line justice principles in Ghana. Um, so please do try and attend that lightning talk or um, support Jeffrey, who's working um, with Susie. And in terms of other um, activities, I think one key um, uh, one, one of the key things that we recognized as a group is that if we really want to advance health policy, we need to be able to communicate our science effectively. Um, and so one of the things that we've done as a network um, was actually just to take part in Yale's media training um, so that we could actually just try and communicate our science more effectively. And so we're looking forward to having more uh, activities um, as a group going forward. Thanks, Kieran. I'll just mention, I mean, that, that last activity that you talked about was a great example of, I think, the potential of uh, cross inter cross network or inter network uh, collaboration, right? There are so m all, all of us, I think, could benefit from that, and we we've talked about how to um, improve that sort of cross pollination between networks, and that's a great example of, of that. Mark. So uh, our global addiction network is still struggling to figure out <laughs> the best formula. Uh, there are multiple reasons. Uh, yeah, I mean, what type of activities and 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 goals and, and aims that network should have. Um, w one of the challenges that uh, there are several challenges <laughs> uh, uh, for us to do so. So even before formation of the global addiction network, we have a, we had a core, the current core of 20 or so most active members in that network. We already had a network. <laughs> we have been working on uh, on grants. We had studies, publications. We actually had very active collaboration. Not as a not as a large group, but in a, in a, in a very many uh, interconnect uh, connecting ways. So, so to some extent, the the idea of the network is great, but it feels a little bit redundant. We don't we don't know what else we can do because we we already have a series of meetings, publications, grants, activities, and, and so forth. Uh, my um, sort of uh, ideal goal would be to to bring more new uh, young faculty, young researchers, graduate students. We actually opened a little bit 
you know, the, this, this is this called a, f a faculty network, but we do encourage, you know, uh, students, advanced uh, graduate students to, uh, to, to join us. Um, despite us, this group, and, and a lot of other people at Yale doing a lot of work around the international work in addiction, a lot of our research focus before pandemic and even during pandemic on countries and regions like Ukraine, Russia, Middle East, Iran, China. For various reasons, I'm not going to go and explain it. There's no need for me to explain why, but, but the work in those in this former uh, sites and collaboration is either very challenging or practically impossible for, for us to continue. It would be very difficult to, to bring new uh, researchers in, in any of this, in, uh, to start working in, in addictions in any of these areas and, and regions. So this is particularly challenging. I would, uh, we have a, a small group of active young uh, investigators who are interested, but then the biggest challenge is, is funding. Uh, how do we bring them into the national to international uh, area, and how do I help them establish the sort of you know ultimately independent uh, research without having uh, this some form of initial support? So we are working on on, on various submissions to the current cycle of of, of the uh, of the awards, but. Uh, I heard that you know there was a great um, in this room. There's a great enthusiasm for for global international work. Um, I've seen that that doesn't go <laughs> that doesn't apply to to all our colleagues and and collaborators. You know, I'm getting messages from from NIH that you know the international funding is not necessarily you know strong priority, especially in the areas where. Where we are working, I, I had a, a few months ago. I had a conversation uh, where I wanted to bring, to connect new countries and bring new young researchers uh, from Malaysia to United States and from United States to Malaysia, for example. And and some NIH official explained to me, tried to explain to me uh, the priorities of <laughs> of, of of funding, uh, which I'm not going to repeat here. <laughs> anyway. So uh, there are still organizations, um, probably Fogarty and, and, and other organizations that are supportive of international work, but the climate is, is especially in, in our area where we, we struggle with, uh, with uh, substance use disorder, with um, interconnected HIV, uh, violence, uh, trauma, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, all these new problems related to the to the to the to the armed conflicts and and international policy between let's say China and United States, these are the the biggest challenges that that, that we are facing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are trying to working. Our activities are sort of you know fluctuating. We meet not regularly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have spurs of activities. We have been successful, as you know. We got few uh, uh, awards as a, uh, as a working as a uh, and networking as as a group. Uh, but like I said, it's it's we, we still try. We still don't know what is the best formula for for that type of work. Yeah. So I think we're we're all trying to figure it out together and as a group. And but I. Um, what you were just mentioning, Mark, about uh, some of the successes, uh, can you speak a little bit about? So I'd like I'd love to um, hear a little bit more from the group about how the networks have fostered, you know, collaboration amongst w within. And Mark, you brought up a great example. I think you were referring to the group uh, within your network that has fostered collaboration with colleagues in Jordan. Yes, yeah, and Jordan. had some funding successes and brought collaborators from Jordan here to Yale and vice versa. So. Are you able to speak to that a little bit? Well, that's this is one of the, of the, of our success stories that we we and we put together a group of younger investigators in our network, and there was a funding opportunity uh, that came through U.S. government. It was a small funding opportunity, and uh, we we helped them apply. They they received that funding. They started uh, building. Uh, 
uh, educational collaboration training uh, between Jordanians and, and Yale. There was uh, there were visit exchanges, but again, you know, <laughs> Jordan is right on the border of the of the of, of the of the place where where we can still uh, travel. <laughs> so uh, yeah. So there have been challenges associated. Yes. I do a lot of work uh, myself and, and other colleagues, and I, I hear we can probably even, uh, among Yale investigators, we can probably establish a Malaysia uh, center network because a lot of people are working, uh, working in Malaysia, myself included, and, and many of, of, of my colleagues. That work continues, and, and I am, I've been making a lot of effort to engage people from other departments um, uh, in, in that work. Well, another challenge for us for working on global addiction is that addictions in the United States are continue to, to soar. And, and all of us uh, engage in, in, in tackling the, the opioid crisis and, and, and all related crises in the United States. So, so all the core members are extremely busy with, with multi-site studies in the US. They, and that's 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 another challenge that uh, you know prevents us to fully engage in, the, in or distracts us from sometimes from the yeah. full engaging in, in in international or global work. Yeah, great. Yeah, Evelyn. Um, so this actually isn't directly an answer to your question, but I I think Mark brings up a really important point about some of the you know fluctuating challenges for um, particularly junior faculty who are. Uh, pursuing careers in global health. And in the case of Engine, as I mentioned earlier, I think there has always been a dearth of funding in the global NCD space. And we're lucky that certain institutes at the NIH have taken an interest, but it's very uneven across agencies. And um, even you know during different administrations, it may fluctuate. So I think that one of the key purposes of the network itself has been to sort of have peer mentoring and learning, you know, so that uh, people can maximize their knowledge of opportunities. Um, as Marek mentioned, you have to be very sort of creative and like really understand what the landscape is. And as one individual, particularly a junior faculty person, you really may not have access to that. And so in our, you know, engine group meetings, larger group meetings, um, a lot of time is set aside to just talk about opportunities and talk about shared you know, experiences. Someone said, oh, I heard about this kind of mechanism. Has anyone else applied for it? And then people will, you know, talk about what worked, what didn't, or maybe introduce collaborators. And because I think it is really challenging, and on top of that, adding everything that Mark just alluded to, people may have worries about, you know, going in a certain direction, and how is my, you know, department going to, will they support me, will they not? And, and these kind of networks really play a key role in helping find those peers who have been down that pathway a little bit further along than you are mm -hmm. and can can kind of share lessons learned. So. Yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll add, I think you alluded to, but just to explicitly say, you know, all of you and the other leads of these networks do that, play that role yes, yeah. um, without effort, right? So that's all <laughs> that's right. additional time and energy with the, you know, in the spirit and hope of building collaboration and and bringing in additional resources eventually, but I think Are that you should, offering, just be, Jeremy? No. <laughs> should just be stated. So, uh, just sort of going back to challenges. Yeah. So I think one, one challenge that is particular to the Yale Ethics Network, Global Health Ethics Network, is I would say the lack of a university mandate. So I think that what has been just so amazing about this network is to really find all of the faculty and so many staff who are working with learners in different areas who are excited to think about, you know, what is the example that we're setting for the next generation of global health students who are doing research, clinical work, et cetera, and are being very thoughtful. There are so many people that are putting a lot of thought into how their partnerships are set up and how are they, you know, encouraging uh, capacity building with their partners. And um, But there is nothing that is coming from the top down. And so I think it's been, you know, in some ways exciting as sort of a grassroots initiative to say, well, you know what, we are engaging with the staff running this program, that program, et cetera, and we're just going to start changing things because, you know, they're the ones who are making those decisions. But I think what we would love to get to is a place where we're seeing the schools taking a thoughtful, thoughtful look and saying, well, well, what is the example that we want our faculty to set 
for their students when they're looking at the types of partnerships that they're setting up. So I think it is both a challenge, but also it's been you know exciting to have so many successes in the absence of any kind of overarching mandate. Yeah. I was just going to mention, in, in the context of collaboration, I think one of the things that Susie and I have recognized is that we need to lay the foundation for collaboration within our network um, with the idea that many people have expressed interest in the idea of tri triple bottom line justice, but actually trying to write about that in a grant trying to implement that in your study design. So we're trying to seek funding at the moment to support a fellow who can just write, you know, kind of a how-to guide in terms of applying the principles of triple bottom line justice to your study design, but also could, you know, provide text for kind of the conceptual framework of triple bottom line justice in application to, to health. And what a contribution that would be as well. We just need the us. funding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think one of the challenges we encountered in the beginning was, um, you know, again, I think we wanted to create a forum where we could put together our various expertise and and apply for grants that were asking bigger questions, multi-dimensional questions. Um, I st that is still the hope that is that has happened on smaller scales. But I think my view on the network has changed a bit. I think if if I were to look back in five years, if we could have the network be a place where our junior, where our students, our trainees, are getting excited about our field and about multidisciplinary collaboration so that they could use the network to find maybe two mentors that could be their PhD advisors or think about how they can extend what they're doing into a different dimension. I think that would be a great success of the network um, because that is something I, I hadn't had throughout my training until coming here. Um, so, I, you know, if there's mechanisms that the faculty network uh, could, you know, help to foster to, to support those students would be great. So, for instance, maybe for PhD trainees to identify at least two people in a network or three people in a network to propose a project to seed grant uh, early in their training, something along those lines could be a uh, really to, to shift the focus a little bit more to the trainees because we're all busy. Um, you know, later in our careers, and it's hard to sometimes carve out the necessary time uh, to make those big, big grants happen. But it's really our next generation that's gonna uh, where we need to focus our efforts. Yeah, you know, that, it's a great point. I, and I wanted to circle back. Um, you know, a, m a number of you had mentioned partnerships and collaboration, and we've the discussion so far has been very much centered here locally on campus. Of course, all of the work that we do, whether in New Haven, in the country, or or globally, requires and uh, is fully dependent upon successful collaborations and partnerships. And so, we've had this tension, I think, within the network program as we define the membership of of, of any particular faculty network to be Yale faculty, or in some cases trainees, postdocs, whatnot. That excludes everyone else with whom we work. And so, we've had this talk within. So we have these. Ideally quarterly, although lately less so. Uh, we call them NIPAD meetings or networks in process and development. And the idea is to bring the leads together with me and some of the core members of the YGH team to just talk about the process of nurturing these networks and share challenges and successes. And so we've talked about this issue of how do we navigate those bound this boundary or artificial boundary of this network being Yale focused, but dependent upon all of our partners. And I was wondering if anybody had any comments or thoughts about um, where, where we could go with this or how you've navigated this within your own network? Oh, thank you. Um, so yes, this actually came up just yesterday um, at a engine meeting because we do receive interest and request from colleagues outside of Yale. And of course, we all collaborate actively with many different um, collaborators in um, outside of the country and, and Yale. Um, and so I think it's been something that we've been figuring out the right um, way to make work in the current structure where membership itself is uh, linked to um, being a faculty person at Yale. So um, one plan that we have is uh, to have a symposium periodically where the focus of the symposium is actually to highlight the international collaborators and trainees who are, you know, and, and also Yale trainees, um, who are working in the field 
Um, so that we kind of think of these like concentric circles of, mm. of affiliation with Engine and that the goal of that activity would be focused on bringing those um, folks in. And, and we've just talked about uh, growing a little bit of social media um, presence so that we can have a, a forum for outside um, um, parties to connect with us, mm -hmm. even if they are not you know, core members uh, in the sense that you just mentioned. Because I, you know, I think we appreciate also the goal of fostering um, Yale faculty career development and, and that there needs to be a little bit of structure to make sure there's focus on that. And um, again, that's been a big focus of Engine, but we very much you know, want to have structures in place to, to bring those outside collaborators um, mm -hmm. into the activities more as well. Yeah, great. Any other thoughts from the group? All right, so I think I'm, I'm getting text messages about an earthquake. Did, was there an earthquake oh, no. here? Was that what that was? There was. Wow. Really? Like, like right here? Like there. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Hope everybody's okay. Um, Okay, so I think we have we have about ten minutes left for this session, and I um, Can we just, just want, say that oh, of course, this panel was earth shaking. It was earth shaking. <laughs> yes, we we, indu <laughs> we induced the earthquake. This panel was earth shaking. <laughs> <laughs> so, would anyone like to um, follow that <laughs> that comment with uh, with any questions or comments for the for the group? Questions about the program, specific networks. Feeling nostalgic, almost more than two de decades ago, I was in this August auditorium as a first year student of Master of Public Health. And now as a primary care physician on the ground, I have a suggestion or maybe a question for Professor Marek. We have a huge mental health crisis in this country. And at a primary care level, we struggle to find enough clinicians, let alone, let alone behavioral health counselors for our patients. I was wondering, does, as part of your global networks, would it be beneficial to learn from countries which have strong social connections and may not have such high rates of mental disorders and use of pharmaceuticals? Just a humble suggestion. I have limited hearing, so I don't I don't quite understand uh, the question. Can you make sure. Can so, you repeat so the me? question from a primary care physician, public health trained primary care physician in the community, was um, how can we learn from societies, cultures that may have lower rates of uh, mental health disorders and lower use of pharmaceuticals to uh, improve what we're how we care for our own population locally. I think that's the question. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> this is an excellent question, but I think that's, this is the, the key activity that we should be doing in the, in the global work, learning from experiences of, of other countries. And mm -hmm. we strive for that, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, uh, well, yeah, this is an interesting question, but you made some assumptions where, where you, <laughs> that, that, that there are vast differences in, in, in mental health problems and, and uh, substance use across different cultures or countries. Uh, yeah, there are differences, but they are not that vast. And, and actually, you know, that collaborating and exchanging, sharing knowledge and, and, and translating what we learn in one context to another context is, is really what we should be doing. And we have been doing this for, for many years. Dissemination, I myself and a lot of my colleagues not only do uh, research and clinical trials, we try to disseminate our findings. We try to implement them into, into practice in both, in both ways. There's a lot of things that we learned from, from other countries that that, bene that United States benefited in in terms of how we change our approaches to to how we treat the, those problems and then vice versa that that exchange and that collaboration the transfer of knowledge 
was very active in the past. It, it has been slowed down l lately, a little bit, <laughs> but I'm hoping that we can, we can overcome that hurdle and, and continue and accelerate that, that work. Very important. Uh, thanks. Wonderful to hear you all discussing. Um, I am a member of the Global AIDS Research uh, and Faculty Network called Garner with Sheila Shinoy and Jeff Wickersham. And my question for the, you all is that one of the things I love about YGH and these faculty networks is that they're very external facing. We're not always external facing. Um, sometimes for good reasons, we're focused on our students or our own research groups. But uh, a theme that I heard you all, all mention was thinking about how do we have a greater impact, let's say, on policy. So translating evidence to policy, communicating to the public. And I'm just wondering, I, I find these types of networks, uh, we often can find colleagues who are very good at that. And to what degree have you all leveraged these networks to improve your practices? And, and how might we do that, let's say, within the Garner Network or other networks? Thanks. I may, uh, this is, uh, not a international policy uh, example, but I think um, I am also part of the Yale Uganda Network, uh, Antimicrobial Resistance Network, Vector-Borne Diseases Network, which has been fantastic. It's, um, it's allowed us to, to really expand uh, and expose ourselves to different aspects. But with the Yale Uganda Network, and just giving one specific example with Tracy, um, in Uganda, there's been unfortunate legislation, as many are aware, um, targeting the LGBTQ community. Um, many of us here in the audience work in Uganda, and just struggling with how, is in, how, how, to, how to deal with that on an individual basis for our own projects, but you know, reached out to Tracy, and we've had conversations over um, uh, longer than I care to imagine, or mentioned, um, about how to really uh, address this at a university level, you know, a school level, university level. Uh, so the network has really, I think, uh, provided the opportunity to to find others to to have these discussions and then try to bring this up to higher higher level. So if we can inform policy or figure out how to support our students here and there. Um, so I think. This, these networks have really provided the opportunity, at least for, for me, to, to not feel alone in these issues and find uh, other people to discuss and, and think about how we can make solutions. Can I just, just briefly, just to add on to that too, thanks for highlighting that, Sunil. I think um, one other piece about, you know, with this particular example that's been important is there were so many people around the country who are also working in Uganda, working with partners in Uganda, who reached out to say, well, what is Yale doing? And it's very meaningful to be able to say, well, our Yale Uganda network has you know, 19 faculty who are members who are all working in different parts of the country with different collaborators. We convened, and this, these are the thoughtful discussions that we've had. And to then talk with these other colleagues in other institutions around the US and have, you know, have these similar thoughtful discussions, but to have the power of saying there are so many of us that are talking about this and trying to figure out how to navigate our students, navigate our partners, and navigate ourselves through this. So I think you know, locally here that has been, that was a really helpful example, but even, you know, had ripple effects beyond, beyond Yale, so. Karen? Well, I would just say that I've, I've been a student very much in, uh, in the context of trying to inform health policy, um, and maybe I'll call on Susie to say a few words on this, but trying to recognize the levers for change. So where can you actually have impact and affect change? Um, so is that at the local level, connecting with your state representatives, submitting written testimony? You know, is it more at the federal level? And then if it's at the federal level, what are the different mechanisms for enacting change in policy? And that's something that, as someone who grew up in Ireland and then lived in Canada at McGill for many years, um, I didn't understand how the federal government worked. And so just trying to have someone like Susie who could kind of walk us through how policy actually can be changed and the mechanisms to do so was critically important. I don't know, Susie, would you like to say a few words on that? Um, this has been an amazing panel. And Jeremy, thank you so much for your leadership in pulling all of us together. And I have so many things I could touch on. But the one point right now is we are in an unprecedented opportunity that hits us every four years. And we, what 
Kieran and I launched and launched to begin was seizing this time frame to coalesce our best thinking that's cross-sectional, that is reverse engineers from the impacted population. And that goes back to the model executive order we did four years ago. Well, Kieran and I are ready to launch that effort again with developing another uh, model executive order for this next a uh, series of activities, which it begins with a campaign, which gets into a transition team, which gets into the administration. And then following up to a model executive order, there are a number of opportunities to harvest that analysis and apply it into the new decision making that will be coming in from the next administration, which could be the continuation of the current uh, with that. So with BEGIN, what we're trying to do is really provide that table to bring together that cross-sectional um, you know, reverse engineering from the people who are impacted by all of these issues and come up with what we think is a very strong, compelling statement backed by the evidence um, to go forward. So like I said, I just want to emphasize right now we have a very important opportunity that uh, is demanding uh, attention. Um, and then there's a lot of follow-up after that. But, but right now, the next couple of months are real important. And begin to invite you to join us. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Susie. I'll add another anecdote to you know, addressing Luke's question. Um, a, a, about a year ago, uh, really led by, by Mike Skenexny, we, I think, gathered a number of um, pieces of input uh, from network members uh, in the context of NIH considering a um, modification of its policies around um, international partner sites uh, and the sharing of uh, sharing and reporting of, of data to NIH. And I think the network program allowed sort of a, an avenue through which to ask members to, um, uh, to provide input. And we compiled a letter that, um, that was submitted. And um, it, I think you know, th those opportunities are really impactful as well. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Madhu and then Jeanette. Thank you for the uh, wonderful discussion. Along the similar lines, I think given the, the prestige and power that the Yale name has, and given the importance of international partnerships for all of you across all networks, I hope you will do exactly what we've done at McGill. We wrote a very strong letter to our immigration minister saying that we are very unhappy with how Canada has been dealing with the visa issues. It has been devastating for us. It was bad all along, not as bad as the US. US is the world's most visa hostile country. Canada didn't have that reputation, but post pandemic, Canada is a nightmare. Uh, and, and it's especially bad for African applicants. So you can see that that's a, it's not just a uniform one, okay? They're really targeting some countries. And our AIDS conference in Montreal was absolutely a, a, a shit show because of that, okay? It was shameful. So we wrote a strong letter and we got a four page reply back, right? Which is quite impressive and that can probably happen only in Canada. Um, they are legally bound to reply to us. Uh, but we signed, scores of us signed that letter. So it wasn't like one person writing. It, was, it had the gravitas of McGill name. I think if all of you across all networks wrote a letter to your uh, home department saying that all of these issues are devastating for us, we cannot be bilateral partners, equitable partners, if this is how you're going to treat people. Because your first visa appointment in some countries is two years from now. Yeah. What on earth can you do? Who can you invite? What kind of conferences can you run here if this is how our own countries are going to be behaving? So it's along the lines of what you said. There is an advocacy opportunity, and if you've done it for that NIH issue, there's no reason why you can't do it for something similar uh, as well. Yeah, thank you, Monica. And, and you no, Jeremy, I was just going to say, it sounds like this would be a great uh, example of what uh, like cross-network um, activities could be, because what Susie talked about, I mean, that was, you know, nothing that I have experience with, or many, many of our members, and I, I think we would love to hear more about just how that came together yeah, and, how to and what the, this, the, yeah, the how power to harness of the networks to, to really make advocate for change. Yeah, thank you, Jeanette. Did, no, okay. I, I think we're oh, one maybe final question in the back. Yeah, I think those are almost That's okay, right. Daniel. That's all right, Daniel. Go for oh, go for it. 
I want to thank all the speakers. Um, just really quickly, I know we're out of time, but um, I know it was mentioned a few times about junior faculty and development, and I'm just, as new junior faculty, I just want to know, is there anything in the works for kind of bringing us together, bringing resources to junior faculty? I think three of you mentioned that that's something that is, uh, has been discussed, and I think it'd be really beneficial for someone who's going into a career in global health research. A lot of you have been mentors to me, so I just was wondering if that was something I appreciate it. Yeah, well, I think maybe I'll, I'll close out the session by, by trying to address your question, Daniel. I think, um, you know, through the network program, we really try to um, advertise and disseminate the internal grant opportunities, um, as Evelyn said, within Engine, and hopefully this can be a model for other networks to, within their networks, disseminate experiences and expertise that maybe more senior uh, members might have to um, potentially mentor or uh, at least advise on, uh, on, on funding opportunities or, or, or other career uh, informing or career changing opportunities. So uh, we haven't formally discussed that as a network program, but I think, again, opportunities to do so. Um, so maybe I'll close out just by thanking all of you and all of you for participating um, in today. And uh, again, if you uh, have interest in either joining an existing network, uh, if this seeded an, an idea in your mind for creating a new one, um, don't hesitate to, to contact uh, myself or Mike uh, at any point today or, or later. So thanks so much. Thank you.